Diagnosing electrical problems is probably one of the toughest challenges most technicians face, but it doesn't have to be. Electrical circuits follow some pretty strict rules. It's simply a matter of figuring out what basic element is missing. To do that, you'll need to be comfortable with some fundamentals, know how to read a wiring schematic, and learn a testing technique you may or may not have heard of. That technique is voltage drop testing, and that's the topic of this edition of the MotorAge How-To video series, The Trainer. Before you can become comfortable with voltage drop testing, you first have to be comfortable with some logical and fundamentals. And unfortunately, we're not going to have enough time to cover all of that in today's edition of the trainer. But MotorAge.com has got some great resources for you online, both in the archive print features and resources in our community. And I promise at the end of the video, I'll share some of those links with you, and I certainly invite you to check them out. Let's start by building an electrical circuit. First, we'll need a source of electromotive force, or EMF. Electrons don't move on their own, they need a push. The most common source of EMF is the vehicle's battery, and we measure the amount of push it provides as voltage. The battery has lots of electrons stacked up on the negative side and a shortage on the positive side. If we connect those two together, all those electrons from the negative side are going to be lined to the positive side. That's the path, and it has to start and end at the battery. Hey, you string a wire between two posts on a battery, and it's very quickly going to burn through because of all the current flow through it. Those electrons on the negative side are darn sure going to try to get to the positive side, and they're going to do it in a hurry. And that's what electricity is. It's the movement of electrons through a conductor. Now, we call that current flow, and we measure it in a unit called amps. Now, if that current is flowing in only one direction, it's called DC current, direct current. And if it alternates one direction and then the other, it's called alternating or AC current. But this circuit serves no purpose. We want electricity to perform a task, some kind of work. The component that does the work is called the load. A load can be a light bulb, a motor, ignition coil, or a host of other components. If we leave things as they are, the load will be working all the time. We need a way to interrupt the flow of current so we can turn the load on and off when we want. That's the job of the control device, or the component that opens or closes the current path. Switches and relays are some examples of control devices, and you can find them on either side of the load. Fuses, circuit breakers, and fusible links are called circuit protection devices, and are always in the current path between the battery positive post and the load. These devices are thermal in nature, heating up with current flow, and are there to protect the wiring from direct shorts to ground. Hey, is an electronic control module, is that a load or a control? Kind of depends on what purpose it's playing in the circuit, doesn't it? It's certainly a load, it's got to have good power and grounds. That's true with any control module. But there's also little switches called drivers in those control modules that operate a variety of devices on the car. For example, the engine control module might operate the ignition coils, the injectors, the EVAP solenoid, and so on. In that case, it needs to be diagnosed like a control. What about a relay? A relay is an electrically operated switch and can also be considered a load and a control device. The load side is that part of the relay that operates the internal switch, while the switch, of course, is the control side. Hey, the last thing I want to talk about is resistance. Resistance is the opposition to current flow. And everything in the circuit path has some resistance. That's the wiring, the connectors, the switches. But the only real source of significant resistance should be the load. That's the component that determines how much current that circuit should draw. Think of the total picture. The revolving door you're watching is the load, and the people are electrons. It takes force to overcome the weight of the door and make it turn, doesn't it? The force is voltage, the door's weight represents resistance, and the people moving through represents current flow. Once the electrons have overcome the resistance, the force is no longer needed, and it drops. 
and that, in simplest terms, is voltage drop. Hey, the circuits in the car are wired in series or parallel or a combination of the two. The individual loads, though, that you're faced with troubleshooting on a daily basis can all be treated the same. Uh, as our newest contributor, Joe Glassford, points out, don't think of the circuit path, think of the current path and what's going to affect it. Now, if the voltage is fairly constant, the only thing that's going to affect current is resistance. That's one of those strict rules that I told you about. If resistance increases, current flow decreases. If resistance decreases, current flow increases. In the real world, there's a lot of things that can cause thieves in the system, extra resistances that shouldn't be there. Corroded wiring, loose terminal fits in the connectors, even loose grounds can all cause added sources of resistance. And remember boy, I told you, if I've got current flowing, the voltage applied to the circuit is going to drop equally across the resistances that it encounters along the way. So if there's more than one resistance in there, they're all going to try to take their fair share. So the only way that we can use voltage drop as a testing method is to make sure that it's dynamic, the current's on, the circuit's turned on. So we're gonna go do something with the uh, tail light circuit on this vehicle. Let's go ahead and get that turned on. I'm using a tool called a Power Probe 3 to perform these basic tests. It has a built-in voltage display accurate to a tenth of a volt, a selector switch that immediately lets me apply known good power or ground, and a few other neat features. I especially like the long leads that allow me to stay connected to the battery no matter where on the car I'm working, and that's important when properly performing a voltage drop test. Don't have one? That's okay. Your digital multimeter sets the volt scale will work just fine, and is even the tool of choice on some sensitive circuits. You can easily make extended leads using 20 gauge wire. Oh, but leave that test light in your toolbox. You'll miss problems if you rely on that tool alone. With the power probe leads connected to the battery, the tip of the tool works the same way as the positive lead on your voltmeter. And that's the lead you want to use for your testing. If you're using a voltmeter, connect the negative meter lead to the battery negative post and leave it there and use the positive meter lead to do your measurements. And the first measurement we want to take is the potential force the circuit is starting with. In this case, the voltage at the battery. Measure right at the posts, if at all possible. The cable clamps are, after all, a connection that could be bad. The next measurement should be taken as close to the load of the circuit you're troubleshooting as possible. Thieves can exist anywhere in the circuit, so you need to check the entire path. That's about what we measured at the battery, isn't it? What if we measured a lot less? What do you think that tells you? Remember this, voltage is needed to overcome resistance, to push the electrons through, make that revolving door turn. Another strict rule that applies here, all the voltage will be used to overcome all the resistance. If there's more than one source of resistance, the voltage available will be equally shared by the resistances in the circuit. Instead of one door to push through, those little electrons have another, and they'll need a push to get through each one. But there's only so much to go around. If the resistances are equal, the voltage applied will be equally split between them as shown in the diagram. Now rarely are the unwanted resistances in the circuit the same as the resistance of the primary load. In fact, there may be more than one thief in the mix. And there are different opinions on what the maximum you should see are. Now personally, on most circuits, I use the limit of half a volt. If it's computer control can circuit, one or two tenths, and if it's a high current circuit like a starter, probably a volt or more is okay. But I tell you something, from my experience, 
you're not gonna quibble over tenths. If there's a thief in the system, it's gonna stand out. It's gonna be significantly more. Don't worry, if there's something there, you'll see it. When the measurement on the Lowe's power side is less, the source of that unwanted resistance has to be between where you are and the battery positive post where you started. What you measured at the load is what the thief left over after he was done. To find out where that SOB is hiding, simply follow the current path back towards the battery until your reading returns to normal. He has to be between your last two measurement points, and you can narrow in on him from there. If the power side measurement is okay, move the test lead to the ground side of the load. This is after the resistance, so the voltage should drop to near zero. It won't be perfect because the wiring and connectors have a normal amount of resistance in them. But just like we talked about on the positive side, a significant reading above zero is showing you that there is a thief laying in wait between your test lead and the ground side of the battery. And the reading you're getting is the voltage he's waiting for. I use the same half a volt spec for most circuits, but again, if there's a problem, you'll know it. Finding a ground side thief is the same as finding the power side son of a gun. Using convenient test points, move toward the battery's ground connection until the reading returns to normal. The thief lies between those last two test points and you can home in on him from there, just like baseball players do when a runner's caught between bases. Okay, you've taken your three measurements, you checked source voltage, that's okay. You got as close to the component as you can. Let's say you're right at the connector on the back of the component and you check the power side reading, that's okay. And then you went to the ground side and guess what, that's okay. So what's the problem? Got to be between the last two test points. It's got to be in the component. Maybe there's an electrical fault, even a mechanical one, that's really causing your problem. And by the way, here's some meter readings that you might see and what the meter's trying to tell you with them. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time that we have for this edition of the trainer. Thanks for watching. Uh, voltage drop testing is not hard to do. It's understanding what the meter is trying to tell you that takes some practice. Take some of the things that you learned today, build a simple circuit in the shop, play with it until you make it your own. And as I promised, here's some resources coming up at the end of the video to help you continue learning about voltage drop testing and adding that very, very important tool to your toolbox. So again, thanks for watching. I'm Pete Meyer, Technical Letter Motor Age Magazine. I'll see you next month.